2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> it is good to have David Taylor and his wife, Roseanne, Rosanna. Her maiden name was Anna Dana. Some of you will get that later. Rosanna, Anna, Dana. Um, 2 Corinthians 11. In all seriousness, didn't you tell me, you told me a little bit about, of course, you're, the first thing people ask you, oh, you're from Salt Lake City, did you used to be a Mormon? You did, okay? So, they have a different Jesus than the one that you currently, believe, well, forever believe in. Amen? It is not the same Jesus. It's not the same guy. Okay? This Jesus, in the Mormon church, has a brother. What's his brother's name? Lucifer. Satan. It's what they believe. Okay? This Jesus father used to be a human on another planet Kolob okay and um, yeah that's not the same that's not the same Jesus that we teach and preach amen uh, no wonder Joe Smith was chased out of every town that he ever fell into, with the exception of Salt Lake City, okay? Uh, but he was chased out of everywhere, jailed. He was, a he was a fraud long before the Book of Mormon. And that just kind of tells you what kind of man he was, all right? But he is revered uh, just about as high as Jesus is regarded and revered in the Mormon church. If Joe Smith said it, well, then that's it. Joe Smith said this. That's, that's all we need. What, 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 WWJD in Mormonism is what would Joe do? Okay? So um, I appreciate you guys, uh, number one, coming all this way to Festus, Missouri. Number two, coming all this way here. Of rejecting the Book of Moron, Mormon. Yeah. Rejecting that and... Um, They've asked to be baptized here this morning, and we, we got you ready. Um, and we're not going to pronounce the names of dead people while we're doing it. Amen? All right, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Because now we're going to get into, if you think I've been dragging this part out, wait till you get into this part here. Okay? Uh, it's like the... For, I had, has anybody ever had chutney? Chutney. C-H-U-T-N-E-Y, N-Y, maybe? In uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, they have all these little ritzy shops. And um, it's because you have a lot of high-rolling gamblers and uh, mafia guys in Hot Springs. And I'm sure they buy this stuff all the time. So we were in one of these shops, and it's like the second time I was in this shop, the first time I decided I wouldn't touch anything in there, it's too much. But we were in there just killing time, and I, they had samples. Now, any vacation I take, if there's samples, it's a great vacation. So I'm in there, and they got samples of just about everything they got in there, and so I'm going through sampling stuff, Todd. I'm just sampling a little bit, sample a little bit of that, sample some of this. And I got to this jar of stuff, and it, was, it said chutney on it. And I'm going, I've heard that word on the food channel, but never knew what it was, never had it in my mouth. So they had some samples of it, so I just took the little spoon. There's another story I've got to throw in here. At least I, I'm, I'm at a one station sampling stuff, and I reached over and I grabbed a spoon, and I stuck it in their dip, and I'm eating their dip. And Lisa comes over and says, what you got? I said, well, I'm sampling this dip. Now she saw me and she said, where'd you get that spoon? I said, well, they got them right here. I said, I got mine right here. When I pointed down to the box that the spoon was in, it said, throw away spoons. Oh, no. 
the spoon paused not before it went in my mouth, but after it came out of my mouth. I'm going, you know, it's not bad, though. But I sampled this chutney, and I'm going, that is really good. I gotta get me some more of that. So I sampled some more and I'm going, mmm, that is delicious. I don't know what you use it for, but I just eat the jar. So I got another sample and I'm going, okay, I'm sold. I'm buying this, whatever it was. And it's a little jar about like this. I'm thinking like eight, nine dollars, something like that, five, six dollars. Turn it over, thirty-five dollars. And I went, nah. Okay. Well, what I'm gonna give you is better than chutney but it's free okay would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy for I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ Paul realized his ministry realized what he was in for what he was doing realized his responsibility that he was going to be a jealous Guardian, a jealous overseer. The church was very precious to him. Paul realized as an apostle that it's his responsibility to present the church to Jesus Christ as a chaste virgin. It means pure. It means Paul told Jesus, Jesus, I'm not going to let your church pour around on you on my watch. I'm not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let anybody that decides to go out and defile themselves with other gods, you just count them out. I'm not going to present you an impure bride. So he said, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that, pre if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Now I want you to underline he that cometh. I don't think I've mentioned this in this whole thing so far. He that cometh. Anybody want to guess who that is? Number one, it's Joe Smith. Joe Smith came and presented, number one, another Jesus. Jesus. That's King James for Jesus. Another Jesus. Joseph Smith presented another spirit. And he gave them a different gospel. Because the Mormons believed that Joseph Smith restored the gospel. Because the true gospel had been lost in all the Protestant churches. And so what he taught was that he was restoring the, go the true gospel that had been lost, hidden, kept secret. Nobody was teaching it except for him. And that, in the 1800s, there was a whole slew of these wackos like Joseph Smith, um, Ellen White, uh, Charles Taze Russell, uh, William Miller, um, scores of others who taught that the true gospel had been lost and that none of the churches were, were preaching it. And that God was going to use so-and-so to restore this gospel. Whether it was Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell uh, or William Miller or Ellen White or any of these other groups. That they were going to be used to restore this gospel. So it's a different gospel. If he that, come, he that cometh is the false prophet of Revelation 13. Okay? That's, who that, that's, that's the epitome of that. Now like I say, there's many other applications. Anybody who is teaching another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel, they are part of that. But the fulfillment of that is the false prophet of Revelation 13. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this idea of another Jesus. That's where we're going to start. It's going to take us a little while to get through that. And then when we get done with that, we're going to teach another spirit. It's going to take us a little while to get through that. And then we're going to see the other gospel. And what we're going to find out is that all three of these are tied together. Okay? If you have another Jesus, 
then I promise you it is not going to be the same gospel. Okay? The Mormon Jesus does not teach the same gospel as the real Jesus does. And they are not of the same spirit as the, as the real Holy Spirit is. All right? So then we're going to talk about this other, go other gospel. And again, it's going to take a little while. But it's like really good chutney or a really good plate of fried chicken. Once you start eating it, you just can't stop. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at another Jesus. Follow along in these scriptures. 1 John 2.18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Notice that term, Antichrist. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. There is the perfect fulfillment of who the Antichrist is, and there are all these partial fulfillments of who the Antichrist is. In other words, we know that Revelation 13 is going to come to pass, the beast is going to rise up out of the sea, he's going to have seven heads, ten horns, and he's going to make war with the saints, and the dragon is going to give him his, his seat, his power, and great authority. He is the Antichrist. But throughout history, there have been little Antichrist-type men. There has been various men maybe even women, but there's been various religious figures that have sort of taken on the nature of Antichrist. They've had the same spirit as, as the Antichrist. They have the same gospel as the Antichrist is going to have. And it's a witchcraft gospel is what it is. It's based on witchcraft. So there have been throughout history all these little Antichrists that have come along. Joseph Smith is one of them, like I said, and all these others, all right? Uh, there are many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. The, the phrase anti, and I want you to think about what that means, all right? 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now there's some things packed into that. Number one, Jesus said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, I am the only begotten Son. That's what Jesus said. Paul said of Jesus, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So, when, when you see here, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are what? One. Every other Jesus, every other spirit, every other gospel, always reduces Christ to be less than equal with the Father. Always reduces in somehow the deity of Jesus Christ always reduces the fact that in Isaiah chapter 9, five names were given for, to the Messiah. The first one was wonderful. What was the second one? Counselor. What was the third one? The mighty God. What was the fourth one? The everlasting what? Father. The Prince of Peace. And while they'll say, oh yeah, he's the Prince of Peace. Is he the Everlasting Father? Well, what the Hebrew really means is, Brother Reg told me this story one time that he had a couple of these guys on the white shirt gang, the white shirt, black tie, bicycle gang, came and terror, tried to terrorize Reg Kelly. <laughs> and he knew who they were, and they bicycled up to him. He was sitting in his truck, had his cowboy hat on, you know, and has... Of course, you know Reg, he's got a rifle in the back of his pickup, all right? So anyway, these guys came up to him and, and they started talking to him, you know, hey, you know, we just, we, you know, want to help try to teach you about Jesus. Can we teach you about Jesus? Reg said, um, 
he said, I, I, I want to ask you one question. And them two boys said, yeah, go ahead, ask us any question. Now, you've got to remember something. These Mormon missionary guys, they are very well trained. They are very well indoctrinated. It is very difficult to try to trip these guys up. You know, so you know what you do? You hit them straight on with the truth. And don't back down. Reg asked these guys, let me, say, let me ask you guys one question. Is Jesus um, God Almighty? And the lead guy, he, he took that question and he went about 300 yards to the left of it and started trying to get Reg away from answering that question. And Reg said, well, let me get back to this original question. Is Jesus God Almighty? And so then he went 200 yards to the right with it. And, he, and Reg kept pushing it. Is Jesus God Almighty? And he could see the veins popping out of this guy's head. And his face turning red. And finally Reg said, I'm going to ask you one more time and I'm going to pull out of here. Is Jesus God Almighty? And the guy said, no, he's not. Reg said, thank you for being honest. And Reg gave him scripture. Okay? And of course, their response to that is, well, that's the King James Bible, and that's not been translated right. Joe Smith put on these special Urim and Thummim glasses. Okay? Anyway, anybody who will reduce who Jesus is and his relationship to the Father, that is the spirit of Antichrist right there. The Hebrew Roots Movement does it. The Mormon Church does it. I'm finding out that it is he is being reduced and or completely eliminated even in Protestant churches. And I'll give you an example. When we pray in this church, we do not ever pray directly to God the Father. Never. You can't. You can't. You must have a mediator. And it's not me, and it's not the Pope, and it's not the uh, priest, okay? It is, and it's not Mary. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not pray through Jesus Christ, you are not praying, okay? Contemplative prayer is a prayer practice that you, you go into a meditative state, you completely empty your mind, you turn it into a void. There's nothing there. And the idea is, is that once you have cl cleared this space and made it empty, then God's going to come in and fill it. And you are going to hear directly from God, who is inside of you, without the mediator, Jesus Christ. In other words, you are bypassing Christ and going to God directly. That is what he said denieth the Father and the Son. There is a relationship between those two that you either accept or you reject. And if you reject it, it you are, that is the spirit of Antichrist rejecting it. And when you reject Christ as the mediator between you and God, that is the spirit of Antichrist. So you recognize it. Does that make sense to everybody? Keep that in mind. Keep that in, underline this in your Bible. Make a little note. That what God the Father is, Jesus is. Amen? Okay? So just kind of ponder that in your mind. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Alright? John 4, 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now here's why I put this together. Okay? You have the word anti and Christ. Christ is Messiah. Messiah is Christ. The word Messiah means anointed one. The word Christ means anointed one. They both mean the same thing. Do not fall into, and I know some of you have been through this already, the Hebrew roots cult idea that says the word Christ is a pagan term. If you use that term, you're, you're calling on pagan gods, and that's an abomination. He is Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay? Only two times in your Bible. No, that's not true. 
two, maybe three times in your Bible is the word Messiah ever used. And yet Christ is used how many times? 555 times. King James Bible. Okay? He's Christ. He is the Messiah, but he's Christ. Okay? Don't let anybody take that with you. Anyway, the word anti means against or in opposition to. Somebody give me another word with the word anti in it. Come on, come on. Anti-inflammatory. And Anti-freeze. Pretty good. That means it is in opposition to freezing. So am I. Okay? It is opposing freezing. It will not let something freeze. Anti-inflammatory. It will not let... See us old people. We know these words, don't we? Anti-inflammatory. Take me a big wad of them every day. Okay? We don't like things getting inflamed. So an anti-inflammatory prohibits inflammation. Take that and apply it to anti-Christ. Anti-Christ will stop Christ if he can. He is a replacement for Christ. He is in opposition to Christ. He is against Christ. He is the vicar of Christ. Does anybody know what term that is? Vicar of Christ. It's the Pope. The Pope is the vicar of Christ. He is a vicarious substitute for Jesus Christ here on this earth. What the Pope says is Christ saying it. Period. No arguments. Okay? That's what that means. The Pope, by his very definition and his very title, is an anti-Christ. And our Christian forefathers knew that. Our Christian forefathers, including the translators of the King James Bible, if you ever... Get a chance. Go online and read the King James translator's letters, letter to the readers. In these old King James Bibles, there is printed in there something like a 15-page letter that the translators wrote to the reader. And in that letter, they denounced popery. Not potpourri. Popery. They denounced the Vatican. They believed, these translators believed that the Pope of Rome was an Antichrist, if not the Antichrist. And they were right. And you've seen Chris Pinto stuff, how he shows that the Pope and the Jesuits, the Vatican itself, despises the King James Bible by name. They don't want Catholics reading the King James Bible. They said, do not read a King James Bible. It's forbidden. That ought to tell you something, Roman Catholics. Amen? I mean, didn't, didn't, your, didn't your mind wonder if your mom and dad said, now, I don't want you to ever catch you doing this, and they were doing it? Didn't your mind go, well, if they're doing it, it must be pretty good. Why don't they want me doing it? Okay? Anyway, the word Christ is anointed. So there is a false anointing that relates to another spirit. These are all woven together. Anointing has to do with the spirit. Christ has the seven spirits of God in him. That's Isaiah chapter 11. He's the root of David. And he has all seven of those spirits of God. That's what gives him the anointing. That's what gives him the title of Christ. So, if it's Antichrist, it is a false anointing. It is going to be a false spirit. It is not ever going to be the real spirit, and it's not ever going to be the real Bible. Okay? Cults may use the King James Bible, but they will have other things that circumvent the King James and in places destroy the King James. Okay? I'm probably not making myself very clear on that, but just because the Mormon church used the King James Bible, that didn't mean they're right. Just because some of these other guys say, oh, we use the King James Bible. We use a King James Bible. I want to hear them say, I believe every word in the King James Bible. You don't hear me denouncing or otherwise mistreating or abusing. Or, what? how does it Paul say? We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Okay? 
They do. They corrupt it. They'll use it and they'll corrupt it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he's called the man of sin. Let the man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In contrast, the Antichrist now, remember, he is the contrast to Christ. If Christ is white, then he's black. If Christ is the day, then he's the night. Is that, see, see where I'm going with this. If Christ is positive, then he's negative. If Christ is North Pole, then he's South Pole. All right? Or bipolar. <laughs> okay? But anyway, he's the man of sin. Well, think of who Christ is. Malachi 4, 2, But unto you that fear of my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So here we have opposite. We have Christ who epitomizes... Everything that is right in this world, and he is full of righteousness, and yet here is the Antichrist who is the man who epitomizes everything that sin is. He is the fruition of all of mankind's evil. Let's say that this congregation represents the world. While this guy here may be a drunkard, this guy over here is a thief. This guy over here is a murderer. This gal over here, she's a gossip. This guy over here, he does drugs. And what I'm saying is, in the world, you've got all these people in the world, and you have one guy who's, who does a lot of this sin, another guy over here does a lot of that sin, another lady over here who does a lot of that sin, and then you have the man of sin, who is the sum of everybody's sinfulness. Amen? He is the fruition. He is the whirlwind that man reaps because of what man has sown. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, Ryan, how many times is the word Christ mentioned in the Bible? 555 times. King James Bible. All forms of the word righteous. 555 times in King James Bible. Righteous, righteousness, righteousnesses. Every form of the word righteous found the exact same number of times as the word Christ in your Bible. See, I like that kind of stuff. Okay? But here's what I'm saying to you. Here's the Antichrist. He is the man of sin. Here's Christ. He is the son of righteousness. Those two are not buddies. You cannot serve Christ and Antichrist at the same time. You cannot have how many masters? You cannot have two masters. You're going to have to decide whose side you're going to be on. You want to live for sin? Go live for sin. You're going to serve the Antichrist. He's the man of sin. You want righteousness in your life? Then go serve Christ. He's got plenty of righteousness. He's got enough righteousness for everybody. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, bless your word. Open our eyes. Lord, this is a deep subject. Father, we can see plainly in your word who Christ is. Father, I believe, Lord, that if we'll devote ourselves, we can then see plainly in the Scriptures who the Antichrist is. And while we do not know his name, while we do not know exactly how he will appear, we believe, Father, that when he does, your people are going to recognize him, Father, because they believe the Bible and they know, what, they know God. They're going to look at him and say, that's the man of sin. Father, just open our eyes in these last days. We believe that those days are approaching. So God, help your people and give us plenty of wisdom and knowledge in these days. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. By the way, I'm going to give you this one thing real quick. It's been on my mind all week long. God, I found one of these men that, that's neato verse in the Bible. Nobody knows the name of the Antichrist right now. Nobody does. Don't believe anybody on the internet that says, I know the name of the Antichrist. They're lying through their teeth. Because I read a verse in the Bible. It said, the name of the wicked shall rot. Okay? Which means that at one time in history, his name was known, I believe. But over the years, his name has rotted and corrupted so that no one knows it. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? At, at some point, I think his name is going to be revealed. And God's people are going to go, oh, that is uh, Psalm, you know, 14, verse 12. That's what that is right there. Okay, that's, that's my little deal. All right. That's my neat verse for the week.